kidding me? Amazing. How are you, church? You doing good this morning? Woo, yes, yes, yes. I got to tell you, we were, uh, Michelle and I were out of town last weekend, and we were able uh, to go visit uh, somewhere else. And I was, as I was sitting there, I was just encouraged uh, by our church as we, were, as we weren't there. And I was just encouraged the way uh, that Brandon and Megan and all these guys lead so well, and the way you respond so well. And uh, I missed that while we were gone last week. So just be encouraged by that, all right? Pat yourself on the back like this. Literally do it. I'm watching you. Um, but uh, it's been, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good day today. We are finishing up, this week is our last week in our, our James series, and then we're walking into one that we're really excited about uh, called Grave Robber Series, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be truly, truly amazing, and uh, we're excited about uh, today. We're really excited about Easter Sunday. How about you? Good? Yes, yes. So if you got one of these when you, when you came in, um, and here we talk about this all the time. There's a connection card. Whether you go here all the time or this is your first time, please fill it out. We can know uh, how to pray for you and, uh, and, and where you're at in your walk and how we can come alongside you. Uh, this is really large and bold, and it says we need you. And if we didn't, we wouldn't make it this way, right? So we need people. This is still a small church plant, right? And so we need people uh, on Saturdays to kind of help come for an hour or two, kind of help us set up. And you don't have to do it every Saturday, although if you want to, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but we don't want you to do that because you're going to get burned out, right? So we want you to, to just use uh, some of your giftings and stuff. If that's just being muscle and running cables and you're like, Wes, I can do that, then please do that. And we need some people to join us on Sunday mornings to be, help be greeters. And so it's about, it says right here about 20 people to serve just once a month, right? So once a month. And so if you would like to do that uh, on the greeter, just write greeter or setup on the connection card, which is this. And so please do that. There's a lot of good stuff happening. Am I missing something? I'm trying to figure out if I'm missing something that's good. The Lord is good. Come on. Y'all know what I'm saying. He is. Hey, go find somebody. Go cross the aisles. Go say hey to somebody you haven't met before. We'll be back in just a second. Hopefully you found somebody to say hey to. Hopefully nobody got skipped. That would be wah wah. <laughs> so we're, we're glad you guys are here. I just wanted to, before we jump into our next um, set of songs, I want to read to you guys a scripture. Um, it's Psalm 30. And it says, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Thank you. 
life. It says in your word that in your presence there's fullness of joy. And so I just pray today, God, that you'd speak to our hearts from your word. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be seated. Real quick, where did, uh, where did Patrick go? Hey, Patrick. Uh, hold on. <laughs> um, you may already know this is Patrick Sweeney. And Patrick is getting a. Patrick's getting married Saturday. And uh, oh, she said yes to the. <laughs> Are you here, Samantha? Come here, Samantha. Come here. We want to pray for them this morning. And so uh, we're really excited about you guys. And we love y'all and love how you serve the Lord. And, uh, you know, God's growing catalyst. Uh, there's one of the small groups who's like made it their mission to grow cows just like babies everywhere. So uh, that'll be on y'all's list later on, too, a few pages. But. But we're going to pray for them. So I'm going to pray for them. And uh, if you would just join with us, we would encourage these guys by our prayers. So, Father, I thank you so much for, um, for Patrick and Samantha. Lord, I thank you that, that you brought them together. God, I thank you that you are um, their Savior and you're their Messiah. And God, I pray for them. I pray you would just bless them with a marriage that gives you much glory. Father, you bless them with a family. God, you bless them with futures that are just uh, written by you, Father, that is just full of excitement and adventure. And, and grace with each other. So God, I just lift them up to you. I pray for them. I encourage them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you are their God and, and they are your people. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll give them a hand if you would. We are uh, really, really excited that you're here this morning. We are, it's an exciting week. Um, this is, you're, you're probably hearing on the news, this is the, the week that's called Holy Week. And uh, it's a week that, that uh, historically celebrates Jesus um, going in, preparing to die for us. And so as we get started, I want to give you a few things that are kind of coming up for us as a church. Next week, we start a new series called The Grave Robber. And uh, it's the, the, the tagline is the idea that how Jesus can make your impossible possible. We're going to look through the book of John, and there are seven main miracles. There's like 34 um, Miracles are seven main ones that teach about the character of God and, and who Jesus was and how he uh, came to earth to show us who God was and show us how to live and to be a, a perfect sacrifice for us. So what I want us to do, I want you this week, when you leave today, you are going to receive a card at the door. And it's an invitation card. And it's not it's nothing fancy, but it's, it's called the Grave Robber. It's got the card on. It's got the tagline. It's got our meeting time. It's got our, our, our location. But here's what I want you to do this week. And I have a marketing undergrad. I was, have a degree in, in marketing and business administration. And marketing, your goal, your dream of a product is for people to get to the place where it naturally comes off their lips. Now, think about it in your world. The, the products you use, the things that you're all about, there are things that you're so passionate about that it's not hard for you to speak of them. If you ever met a CrossFit person, <laughs> you know, you know in about two minutes, I do CrossFit, you know. Sometimes way more than like their faith or their relationship with Jesus, but I do CrossFit, you know. Um, there are things that we identify ourselves with, and it's so natural to talk to people about it. If you ever meet a, a true salesman, it's just easy for them to talk about the thing that they're trying to promote. Here's my goal for us. My goal is not for us to raise enough money to buy billboards. My dream for us is that you and I will be the kind of people that say this, God is moving, and I desperately want you to be a part of it. Because billboards, you, you see and you go, okay, whatever. But when you look at your friends this week and you say, hey, I've got a little card and I'll give that to you. And if you need more than one, we'll get you more than one. But I really want you to be a part of what God's doing in my life and in my church because I think it would help you. If you look at somebody, everybody wants to be helped. So, so our dream is that you will go this week and not, you know, not flood hundreds of people. Maybe that's your thing. But, but more than that, for you to find one or two people who you say, you know what? They're not connected anywhere and I really think this could help you. It could really be a good thing for them. We're going to be talking about Jesus and how he beat grave, the grave. Kicked him in the face. Love that. For eight weeks, starting next Sunday. Next Sunday, to give you a little enticement, we're having a waffle bar. How many guys like waffles? So I think it's going to be a wonderful thing. As we're worshiping, there'll be that smell of uh, Belgian waffles and maple syrup. We're going to have a little sugar high. So at probably 1230, you'll go home and crash. But next Sunday, we're having a waffle bar. Uh, if you want to help, we need people to bring waffle irons and people to bring... Ingredients. We, Christy Curry's set that up. If you want to help with that, we'd love for you to do that. The week after that, we're going to go to a biscuits game. How many guys like biscuits games? It's 
It's way fun. And so we're going to sit out in the, the field seats out beyond the outfield. $10, bring a lawn chair. You can wear shorts to church that day or any day or every day if you want to. Not if it's cold like today, but wear shorts. Come on, we're going to go as a, as a group. And our goal is for you to bring people that might not be in church and for us to get to know them. It's not, it's not magic. We just want to get a chance to know them, get a chance to spend time with them. And the last thing I want to remind you about this morning, Easter morning, next Sunday morning, we're going to be baptizing. We've already got one young man who says, I want to be baptized. So we're bringing out the, the great behemoth that lives outside. Uh, Kyle and Blair are not responsible for moving anywhere. Uh, there's no interstate shenanigans. Um, I'm about to tell that story one day, Charlie. It's pretty awesome. But the, the, we'll bring the baptistry. If you're a person who says, man, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I've never been baptized, we would love, I can think of no better day to celebrate that with you than Easter Sunday. Where you, you show that picture of you dying to yourself, dying to your old life, dying to your sin, and you're coming out of that water to a new life, to a new thing that Jesus alone can give. Christ modeled this for us. He was baptized by John the Baptist. So for us that day, that is like our day. Easter is our day. And so I want you, if you're that person, and you may say, man, I've got questions. The young man's been baptized next Sunday. He uh, made a decision to follow Jesus as, as a young man. Five or six years old. He said, I didn't understand it all. I did it because I wanted to do it because everybody else was doing it. Now he's 11 or 12. He says this, I want to follow Christ for me. We're excited to baptize him. That may be you. You may be a person that says, Matt, I'm not certain about making a decision to follow Christ. Here's what's the beautiful thing about it. The only requirement for being baptized is that you say this, I have called on and confessed the name of Jesus. It, this might be your day of salvation today. You might call on Christ and you might be able to follow Him in baptism next Sunday. So we're excited. This is good stuff. So how many of you think about what I'm going to give you five seconds to think about it. Think about a person this week that you need to reach out to and offer a simple advice. Think about it for a minute. And I'm going to count to three. When I say three, say their name out loud. Is that clear? Yep. Public school kids like me? Is that clear? <laughs> Private school kids? Okay. So think about their name. We're going to say it out loud. First name together. One, two, three. It's okay. Kind of weak. Try it again. You say the same name or another name. One, two, three. Okay, good. I heard a day and average my name. good. Very good. This morning, what we're going to do, we're going to jump in and look at this book of James. James, we've been talking about it for the last three or four weeks, is a practical book. It's, it's like the, the YouTube how-to video. You know, I was, I was getting James Carr worked on a couple months ago, and these guys are supposed to be specialists, and one of them has a big phone, and he's out in the car trying to do the reset after he's done an oil change. And he's Googling it. He's YouTubing. I'm like, you're, you're supposed to be, I pay you good money. He just went to YouTube and saw it and then he did it on the phone. It, it's, James is a really practical book. It's not a book that's 10 miles deep. You don't have to wrestle over the words. What does this really mean? It's, it's straightforward. Now, here's the issue with some of us. Some of us would say, I want to go really deep in the word. I want to, I want to, I want to know the deep things. Here's what I think. I think we don't have time for the really, really deep things until we apply the things we know. Can I go ahead and say that to you again? Yeah. Because we say things like, teach me all the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, all these difficult things. And those things are great and wonderful, and I believe in all of them. But more than that, I need to read the Bible, and I need to do my best to apply it to my life today. This, this scripture today is not, there's nothing hidden about it. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing that you can't even read without any kind of training and see. But it's really, really, really hard to apply. And we're going to look at that together. Let's look at it. We're in James 1. We're finishing up this book, uh, this first chapter. We wanted to give you kind of a teaser of the book of James. We've been looking at it for, we're just going through this one chapter this last month. We're going to jump into the book of John next month, but we may come back later on and finish up James. But here's what it says. This is James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Say worthless. 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 Verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What it's, what it's setting up, we're going to look at it in depth, what it's setting up is it's using this word for religion the writer of James, James is kind of kind of uh, poking fun at some people who are all about the appearance. I went to the, the people that were like, I'm a Christian because I go to 
church or I do all these outward appearance kind of things. The word they use for religion here is referring to festivals and celebrations and very outward visible things. He's kind of poking fun because he's saying this. The outward stuff is not nearly as important because sometimes you have bad motives with the outward stuff. What's really important is the inward heart and the small things you do that not maybe not everybody sees. There are three reminders for us in these verses. Number one, we're going to look at them. Number one, the reminder is our words always reveal our hearts. Do you agree with that? Your words always reveal. Reveal your hearts. It says in verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, what's, what's bridle? What's that, what kind of word is that? You use that bridle with a what? With a horse. Madeline, how, how big is the bridle you use to, to use, buddy? Jump with your fingers. How, how big is that bridle piece in his mouth? Four inches, six inches? If you don't know what a bridle is, a bridle has an attachment, it goes into the gum of the horse's mouth. Now, a horse weighs how much? 1,500 pounds. The bridle weighs how much? The, the piece? Less than a pound, probably. Sometimes it's aluminum, different things. And what that does, it's like if you're ever wrestling with your brother or sister and you can hook your finger in their cheek. They will do anything. I learned with Blair one time, I was a little guy, if you, learn, if you grab somebody's toes and pull them apart, they'll do anything you want. Anything. <laughs> stop and do whatever you want it to do. And the Bible uses that strong picture for us because we've got to learn how to bridle our tongues. It says, if a man, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. The word worthless in the Greek, it means um, without worth. <laughs> worthless. I don't know about you, but when I die and stand in front of God, and I say, I've had this faith in you. I don't want him to ever look at me and say, your faith was worthless. This is real words. We, we need to have a faith of, of substance. In my mom, this is how I think. I wrote like a billboard. Your tongue will inevitably advertise what is inside of you. Next slide, guys. Like a billboard, your tongue will inevitably advertise what is inside of you. So, so think about the way you talk. Jesus spoke to this, and he said this in Matthew 12. He said, either make the tree good, that's your, your life, the way you live, and it's fruit good, so you make your heart good, the fruit will be good, or make the tree bad and it's fruit bad. Look at this, for the tree is what? Known by its fruit. Your words are the fruit of your life. And people will tell me all the time, I'm not a bad person, but this is what Jesus says. He said, then he says, you brood of vipers, this is a really strong word. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Think about that. The things that you say reveal who you are. The things that come out of your mouth, you can say you are one thing, but what you are comes out of your mouth. I have a, a, a guy I know that used to say the 11th commandment is thou shalt not jive thyself. <laughs> Meaning, you can say whatever you want to about you, but what comes out of your mouth is really who you are. So let's ask this. So what's in your heart? Do, do lies come out of your mouth? If lies come out of your mouth, then your heart is a lying heart. Does gossip come out of your mouth? Now, Blair and I have family members who will say, they'll call us and say, you need to be praying for. And then they'll list this horrible thing this person has done. But because it's under the guise of, you need to be praying for, it's okay. That's not okay. It's just Christianese for I'm about to gossip and I don't want to feel guilty about it. Okay? So what's come out of your, of your, of your, your mouth? It does, does slander come out of your mouth? That's in your heart. How many of y'all love hearing these things? Isn't it awesome? Woo! -hoo! Okay. Uh, does constant negativity come out of your heart? Out of your mouth? That's your heart. Don't elbow each other, by the way. I've seen husbands and wives look straight forward. You can talk about this later on after lunch. But if that's what comes out of your mouth, I just want to love you enough to tell you this. That's because your heart is full of those things. Jesus himself said, out of the mouth is the overflow of your heart. Does confusion come out of your mouth? Does 
doubt come out of your mouth? See, we sometimes don't even realize who we are. Find somebody that loves you today, that really loves you, not just going to, not a husband who doesn't want to fight. Find somebody that's willing to speak and say this. What comes out of my mouth a lot? Ask them. What comes out of my mouth? Because that's the overflow of your heart. You, I'm, not, I'm not a person who encourages people. You don't, you don't have an encouraging heart. Well, I'm just critical by nature. No, you, you have a really negative, critical heart. Jesus said it, not me. I'm just the messenger. Out of the mouth is the overflow of the heart. So I don't want you to leave today and say, man, I'm just not going to be critical this week. What, what if, there's a question, what if there's more than us just not being negative? You know, with, how many of you guys are parents? Are there days you're like, if I don't kill my kid, it's successful? <laughs> I was talking with a lady the other day. We are talking about how sometimes moms snap a little bit when they have newborns. And babies are like, they cried for 20 hours. And Jamie and I had this talk one day. She's like, I understand why like, mamas shake babies. Like, I know it's wrong. <laughs> I understand. You know, we went to those little classes where they like freak you out by showing you like the full frontal birth. They're like, oh, dear God. You know, my retinas are burned. And after all the graphic video, they say, and one of the things you need to learn in this class, the only thing I took away from it was if your baby's crying so much and you, and you fed them and they're clean and, you, and it's about to make you snap, put the baby down in the crib and walk away. That's wonderful. Mamas, you need to know that. Daddies, maybe you too. It's wonderful. It's wonderful news. But for some of us, we, we need to realize there's more than just not being negative. See, some of you today, you're going to leave, you're going to try to make this into, I'm going to just be a better, not negative person. What, what if there's more than just not being negative? If you play football or any sport that's worth anything, you're not going to ever win by just doing defense. You've got to have offense at some point. And so for us as Christians, we should never ever just say, you know, I'm just not going to be ugly or act mean or be critical. There are wonderful, wonderful things we can do with our mouths that are positive things to people, but you got to stop the negative and you got to invite the positive. You don't just need to be neutral in this thing. Y'all hear that? Let me see what it says in the Scripture. In Ephesians, it speaks this. It says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, that's that negative stuff, that's the lies, put that away, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. In other words, as believers, we're supposed to always... Speak truth to each other. Now that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're slashing somebody with truth, but we're supposed to speak truth. And it goes on, it says in verse 29, let no one, let no corrupting talk. The word corrupting is like the word for rust. Let no destroying talk. Let no talk that tears people down. Let no talk that, that makes people less. Let no talk that destroys the elements of a person. Let none of that come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. Now, some of us are going to go, I just don't want to be a person that tears down. I'm saying this. There's way more than you just not tearing down. We need to speak words that build up as it fits the occasion. In other words, we need to walk with Christ and know Christ so that when a moment comes up that we've always got a word in our mouth to say to them. And you're not going to have time if you don't, if you don't know Jesus, know His heart, and know His word, and know His spirit, you're not going to have time in the moment to say, can you give me an hour to go pray or read my Bible and I'll get you some words? You're going to have a brief moment. And they're all around you. These moments, these little serendipitous times are all around you. They're waiting for you to respond. There are times you meet people and they're having a rough day and you've got a moment to interject and be Jesus in them. You've got that moment. You can't just not be negative. You and I have got to be about giving words that don't corrupt but build up, that fit the occasion, and this is what I love, that it may give grace to those who hear. You may not know what grace is. Grace is God looking at us and saying this. There are things you do not deserve that are good things. Forgiveness and mercy in my son Jesus. That line that says, I heard mercy call my name. Woo! Mercy called my name. The reason that I get excited and ball my eyes out this morning, all these songs speak in my heart because Christ called me. Christ forgave me. God, Christ gave me grace. And for me to speak grace to somebody means that I want them to be closer to Jesus by the words that I speak. There are a few men in my life that do this for me. There's a guy named Neil Vincent that was a youth minister of mine in high school. Neil will call me and say, hey, uh, what are you doing? Almost, there's almost nothing in my life that I will say no to to get an hour with Neil. Because here's the deal. When I leave spending time with him, I feel closer to Christ. I don't, he, he doesn't sit down and tell me how perfect I am. By any means, actually, he speaks 
sometimes the things I need to change in my life, but he speaks and he's like Jesus as a person to me. He literally, I think he speaks grace to me. When I leave, I want to, I want to follow Christ closer. I want to read the word more. I want to be more bold in my faith. I want to be a better husband to my wife. I want to be a, a better father and mentor and disciple to my child and my future children. Giving grace to somebody. The question is, do any of us do this? Do people leave your presence and go, man, I just, like a moth to flame, i got to get back with some more time with them because I feel closer to God because of that. It's not just being not negative. It's being Christ with our words to people. This first reminder is out of your heart, your mouth speaks. The, the question is, do we give grace by the words we speak? Some of us are so negative, we're so destructive, we tear people down. And I want you to know today, that's your heart. You don't have a, a tongue issue, you have a heart issue. And you've been around people who don't have an issue with that. They, they speak positive, they speak truth, and you want to be around them when you notice there's something different. It's not just their words, it's they've dealt with it in their, in their hearts. The second thing that this teaches us, the reminder number two, is our compassion should move us to take action. It says in these verses... Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, in the New Testament times, there was no welfare. There was no life insurance. There was no government programs. If you were a woman and you were a widow, you were uh, basically of the creek. Um, there wasn't plans for you. There was a, a hierarchical family kind of model where People from a family would bring you in, but it didn't always happen. And you basically could go from being a, a, a rich wife of a, a ruler, and in one accident you could be a beggar on the streets. And, and the same thing went for orphans. There wasn't orphanages. There wasn't state-run agencies. There weren't group homes. It was people that were under serious amounts of distress and need. And, and James says this to us to remind us that it's not just about us getting in here, raising our hands and singing to Jesus. This is important, but it's got to have some feet out, out there. And uh, the question that I want to ask us is this. Who can we show love, extravagant love to this week that's in need? Now, this verse reminds us of people who have physical needs. People that have, um, that have a background that puts them in pressure. But I will tell you this. Most of us don't know many people, some of us do, that would call themselves orphans. Now that Andrew has a different perspective on that, but most of us don't know a lot of people in that way. So you, would, the temptation would be for you to go, well, I don't know any, I don't know any widows or any orphans. I'm good. Woo! Done with that one. But I'll tell you this. Scripture goes a little more than that. It means, who do you and I know that don't just have physical? Who do you know that has an emotional need this week? Because it's not enough for me to sit there on the front and raise my hands and sing to Jesus. If I have people that have hurt and I can help remedy that and, and calm that and give relief to that. If I don't do that, this is not worth crap. It's got to have feet with it. Our, our faith has got to make its way out those doors and into your cubicle or your house or wherever it is that you have leverage and where you live, your team, your workplace, your work team, whatever it is, our faith has got to be more than just here. It's got to get out there. So who do you know has physical, emotional, maybe a financial, maybe a spiritual? Who do you know this week that you need to validate your faith by loving on them? Think about that person. For some of you, it's as simple as saying this. Hey, I want to um, invite you to come be a part of what God's doing at our church. I sent you an email about it before. George Barna, a leading uh, statistician uh, in America, does business in private and, and uh uh, all these surveys for church work. He says this. They did a massive survey across the country. Doesn't matter where it was. They found out about 82% of people will respond positively to an invitation from somebody that they know. Think about that. That means this week, statistically, if you go out and have 10 people in your life that you know that aren't involved in church, and you reach out to them and say this, don't just invite, but you need to bring them and say, hey, I'd love for you to come sit by me and be my guest at church on Sunday morning. Statistically, eight of those ten people would come. So why do people not come? Because we don't what? We don't invite them. It's not on you, it's on me too. I've said a, a billion times, Wayne Gretzky says you miss all the shots that you what? You don't take. You, you never know 
that person that is sitting at their house today, right now going, is life even worth anything? When, when we were, right before we started Calus, we had about a month's time where we had no obligations on Sunday mornings. And it was pretty amazing because I've always been in church on Sunday mornings. Like since I was like out of the womb, go to church, you know. And so one Sunday I told Jamie, let's, we're, not gonna have, we're about to start this new church. We'll be going hard at it for years. So let's, uh, let's go get breakfast. So we went to go get breakfast at Flips on the corner of Vaughn and Taylor Road. Well, they, they were still Flips. Now it's the, the shrimp basket. Or as one of the groups online says, the shrimp casket. They don't like it. Which I think is really funny. The shrimp basket. So we went, and I, in my mind, I'm expecting to be like nobody out in the world, because everybody goes to church on Sunday mornings, and we're driving, and like people are cutting their yards. I'm like, Pinkin! you know, and, and like it's just as busy as every other day. I'm like, how, how can I even be that? That's not right. This is Jesus' day. And in my mind, everybody's going to be in church. And I go there, and the restaurant was fuller than I've seen it in forever. <gasps> well, you know, not everybody's in church, guys. Not everybody's hearing God's Word today. Some of them don't even know that they have a need yet. <coughs> how, how crazy to be sick and not even know you have sickness. You know, there's people that go to the doctor, they're feeling fine. You hear these stories every few years, and they go... Oh, we just found out that Grandma had stage 4 cancer. She's got a month left. You hear those stories. Spiritually, everybody that doesn't know Christ is in stage 4 death. Death's coming. Death has their name and its scope. Has their face on its list. And they don't even know they're sick. And you and I, sometimes with a simple invite, we can intercept them and say, they say, I'd like for you to come. Because when you come here and the Word of God is saying and, and that video proclaims Jesus... And we preach the Word of God. When God's Word, God starts churning hearts. Remember God churned your heart? Had a heart of stone and plowed through, broke that stuff up. And when we start hearing God's Word, they may even know they're sick. And they'll go, man, something's happened with me. When I was in student ministry years ago, had a girl that had never been to church ever in her entire life. And one of my kids brought her to church. This girl's name was Jackie. She came up to me after the service, and I, was, I led worship and preached. And she said, I don't know who Jesus is. This is what she said. But every time you say his name, I cry. So what's the deal with that? Little red-headed 17-year-old girl. I said, Jackie, the deal with it is that he's a, a, he, he was man who's God. He died in your place for your sin. All the things you've done wrong in your life that you feel guilty about. He came to make you new and forgive you of it and give you a new life and a new hope and, and to, to make your life count. And she said, well, how do I know him? It's like this awesome, like, scripted movie. I said, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe... Confess your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart. God raised you from the dead. You'll be saved. She goes, can we do that right now? <laughs> Girl, never been to church her entire life. The Holy Spirit of God was working on her heart, churning her heart, breaking up the hard places, giving her new flesh, giving her a new life. And for some of you today, I'll just tell you this. Care enough about people to invite and bring them. There, there's a point in our lives where the consumerism of, I went to church, it was warm and fuzzy and great, and Brandon saying, woo, God, and all that, that's great and all, but there'll be a day when you go, ah, I don't need another production. And if you're not out doing something, you'll go, you'll be like all the people who say this, I'm just not getting much out of church. It was never designed for you just to get out of. I need some ahas on that. It was never designed. God never intended this. This is a place where you and I bring people who are broken. We are jacked up at Calus. We're really in tune with that. And we can find other people out there who are jacked up and say this. Hey, you're broken. I'm broken. I'm a beggar. You're a beggar. But I found a good source for encouragement and bread and water. Do you want to come? Come on. Do you want to come with me? Because it's free there. You can come and we can learn about God together. Maybe, maybe we can be broken together. But maybe we can be healed together. And God can, can help us and grow us. That's what it means to reach out to the ones who are in distress. Orphans and widows. It doesn't just mean orphans and widows. It means who do you know this week? that has a need that you can help take care of that. The third reminder of the Scripture is that our patterns are supposed to look different. See, you and I have a pattern of life. Some of you have crazy things you do. I had a discussion the other day. I'll ask you this morning. How many of you in this room brush your teeth with, with warm or hot water? Y'all are crazy. Why would you ever do that? Okay, who in this room brush your teeth with cold water? Woohoo! All the winners. Okay. You have, I don't know why that's so... I don't know why you weird people do hot water, but it makes me want to gag. My wife, we got married. We're on our honeymoon. She's got this double vanity with this nice bed and breakfast. And I'm brushing my teeth and look over, and she turns a little, little dial with the red. I'm like, are you about to scrub your face? What, what do you need the hot water for? She goes, I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm like, 
Did you just start doing that? Like, why did you not tell me this before we got married? That's you. <laughs> I thought I knew you. You know, that's a pattern. We all have little patterns. We do. Some people, if you ever watch the show, uh, everybody loves Raymond. The big brother has the OCD thing where he touches his chin with the food. You've seen that? We all have patterns. You have things you do. I double, I double lock the car. Like, my, like anybody's going to steal my 2007 Ford Taurus with the trailer hitch on it. I better take care of that one. <laughs> the clear coat's coming off. Click, click, you know. I shouldn't go like unlock, unlock, big sign. Steal me and destroy me completely. <laughs> that way I can get $40 from the insurance company. No, we have, we have patterns. There are things you do with your life that are your patterns. And the patterns show off who you are. It says in James 1.27, the, the third reminder is that pure religion is to keep oneself unstained from the world. That word unstained, think about it. When, when you have a stain on something, you have removed the substance that caused the stain, but there's still a lingering memory there. You make a lot of money selling things that remove stains. You know, at our house, I'm big, I'm big about coasters on the, on the wood because I don't want, I don't want a, a, a water stain. And in our lives... The flip of this verse is that we can, without, if we're not careful, we can have stained lives. In 1 Peter 2, it says, but you, this is talking about Christians, people that are Jesus followers, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Isn't that great words? That you may proclaim the excellences of him. This is God who called you. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. I hardly ever refer to the King James, but I love this verse in the King James. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to look different, sound different, walk different, talk different. That ye should shew forth, I don't say this ever, the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are supposed to be Different. The pattern of your life as you're following Jesus should be an ever-growing, getting more and more different than the world. Some of us, we get Christ and we start this. We go, you know what? I can do what I want to now. God's going to forgive me. I was telling Dallas that I had a, 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 a period of time in my life where I abused the grace of God. I know God's going to forgive me because He does. And Romans speaks that. It says, what then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound some of you today? I can do what I want because Christ has died for me. Listen to this. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live it? This is patterns, guys. We're all going to mess up. This isn't, this isn't you're going to be perfect, but we have patterns. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Verse 4. We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, look, we too might walk. That's a pattern. We too might have a pattern of a new life. The pattern of your life, if you follow Jesus, is supposed to change. Look at your life and look at the way you were. And if nothing has changed, if the patterns are the same, or heaven forbid, worse, you probably do not know Him. Because Jesus changes people's lives. There are things that were major struggles in my life that I don't even think about anymore. There are things that really wouldn't be a big deal to you, stuff of the heart, that He has helped me with the pattern of my heart. Our patterns are supposed to be different. I'm going to teach this real quick to you. There's, in the Bible, there's, there's two big fancy words you need to know. One is justification. It's got the word just as its root. And the word is sanctification. It's got the word sanctify or sanctity in the middle of its root, or the beginning of its root. Justification is the idea that when a person receives the forgiveness of Christ, it's like a legal transaction. God takes all of your sin, all of your guilt, and He puts that on Christ. It's like a legal thing. Think about it this way. Justification. Just as if I never sinned. Justification. That's a one-time event. Christ did it for us, died for us. Sanctification is a cycle. It's a, it's a process. It means today, if you're a follower of Jesus, there hopefully are things as we worship today, as we've heard the word that God has been revealing to you about your heart. And you're going to go this week here and say, God, forgive me for that foul language. Forgive me for that, that anger in my heart. Forgive me for whatever the thing is. And hopefully this week, because of the power of Jesus, you'll be in a little better pattern than you were last week. Sanctification doesn't save you. It's the proof of that you are already saved. See, a person is justified first, 
And then you become this process of getting sanctified, getting cleaned up. I know it's big words, but there's no other way to explain it to you. Here's what it says in the Bible. We're almost done. In Romans 12, 2, it says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing. That's the pattern of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In 1 Peter, it says this. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy. Look at this. You also be holy in all of your conduct. That's the pattern, guys. So Christ cares about our words that come out of our heart. He cares about our compassion, the way we, we put our heart on people, and He cares about the pattern of your life. Some of you today, you say, man, I know Jesus, but your patterns don't really reflect Jesus. It's not where you need to be. See, change, a changed life is the only evidence that you're growing. If you look the same way you did, but you're like, nothing has changed, then there's probably a pretty serious doubt whether or not you have grown any. The big idea today is that if we have a real faith, then we'll see change in our words, our compassion, and in our patterns. Here, here's the, the thing that you need to know today before we're done. You can't change your words. Do you know that? You can't change your compassion. And you can't change your patterns on your own. The Bible speaks of us being dead in our sin. One of the Psalms today said, I was dead in my sin and shame. The Bible speaks to us being corrupt. The Bible uses words like depravity. Nobody really uses that word very much anymore. All these things that speak of a person apart from God being dead on the table, being away from God, being distant from God, naturally choosing wrong things. Look at a child. Give them a choice to do the right thing or wrong thing. You're going to do the wrong thing. Why do teenage boys destroy everything? Because they're depraved. So are you, but they're depraved. And the Bible speaks this. So for us, it would be easy for you to leave and say, you know, man, I'm just going to go, going to go be better. But we can't change these things. That's why we desperately need Jesus. What did, look at the, the model of Jesus with his words. At the moment that he was being about to be crucified, it says that the Bible says he was, he was quiet. He kept his mouth shut. On the cross, he never, if Christ had for one moment slipped, he could have destroyed all of humanity with one word of his mouth. And yet he kept his mouth totally in control. It says giving grace. Is there anybody that's ever modeled having the right thing to say at the right time more than Jesus? When it speaks about having, you know, the next thing is about our compassion. Look at Christ. The body, you see him interacting with people who were like adulterers, people who were bad people. And what did he always? He always offered grace to people. That woman caught in adultery, she's standing there, and all the men have the stones. And it says the Bible, and he knelt down and wrote in the sand. And I believe that he wrote down all the names of the girlfriends of all those adulterer Pharisees who are about to throw a stone. And then Jesus says this He who is without sin cast the first stone. And the sound of grace hit the ground as those rocks thud. Thud, thud. And he showed compassion. Christ is the perfect model of compassion. And then look at the pattern of his life. Christ, it says in John, that he was the perfect Lamb of God, without blemish, without stain, without sin. He was tempted beyond anything we could ever face, and yet he lived a perfect pattern of holiness, communion, closeness with God. So for you and I today, the call is not you be better. The call today is for you to say this I desperately need Jesus. I don't need a better version of me. Forget me. I need Him. And sanctification is not God buffing up your rusty old car. Sanctification is you becoming more like Jesus. That's what we need as a church. We, this is not a, just go be better. Just go act better this week. You will fail with that. You'll fail with your words. You'll fail with your heart. You'll fail with your patterns. But the day we say this, give me Jesus, things start changing. Let my life be about Christ and everything becomes different then. We're going to finish up with this verse in Romans 10 that says this. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So here's what we're going to do today. We'll be made a little different than we talked about in the back. I'm going to pray for us. Players are going to come give some announcements. When church is over, we're going to be, some of us are going to be lingering in the back. We've got a care center. Some of us will be standing back there. If you're a person that says today, Matt, I, I cannot do this. I've tried on my own. I can't do this, but I need Christ. I want to let you know this. I am inviting you to come call on Him. I'm inviting you 
to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you will be saved. For some of you who already know Him, you need to get back in line with Him. You can't make your words better this week. You can't magically have more compassion. You can't change the patterns on your own. But if you invite Him in and step into His life, He can change all kinds of things. Is that clear this morning? I'm going to pray for us players and come after I say amen. And when this is all done, we'll be in the back. We'd love to talk to you. Let me pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that um, you are with us. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true, that it cuts in our hearts, that it changes us. Lord, thank you so much that um, we can't change ourselves. So we have a desperate need for Jesus. God, thank you so much that, that we get to the end of our rope and there's a great, big, wonderful God willing to catch us. And so, Lord, I pray today for the people in this room who don't know you, who maybe have never heard the, the good news of Jesus, that he, he died in a place um, to forgive them of their sin, to give them new life, to give them hope, to give them direction. Lord, I pray that you will speak to hearts in that. And Lord, I pray for conversations after the service is over that we can just enjoy each other's company, but talk about you. And if there's people that don't know you, Lord, I pray that I find one of us to talk to. And God, I just thank you for all this. Thank you for the way you're moving. Thank you that you're going to bring people next Sunday. God, let us be about that invitation. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you leave today, there will be people at the doors offering these cards to you. Um, obviously, we want everybody to get one, but you can have multiples. So we'll, we'll print more, I promise. So uh, thank you guys for being here. So glad that each and every one of you is here uh, this morning. Earlier, I believe Wes mentioned to you the handout that you've got. Now, in the handout, you'll see a connection card. I believe that was mentioned. That is the one offering that we do want to encourage everyone. Uh, in just a minute, when the guys pass the buckets around, if you'll drop that into the, the bucket, we would appreciate it. Uh, if it's your first time with us, or if it's your first time actually giving us the card, uh, then this week Matt's going to send you, just as a way of thanking you for checking us out here at Catalyst, he's going to send you a $5 Starbucks card. Now, if you want to support financially what we're doing, we do want to make that easy for you. You've got information about that in the handout as well, or you can shoot a text to this number that's up on the screen. If you do that the first time, you'll get a link sent back to you. And on your smartphone, you can uh, click on the link and then set it up so that uh, in the future, all you have to do is text an amount and it will automatically be debited from uh, your, your checking account or however you set that up. Now, other stuff that's coming up uh, weekly, we have community groups that meet. Uh, we, we met this morning, the leaders did, and talked about those groups. We believe that life is better not just sitting here side by side and front to back. We want to encourage everybody to get plugged into a community group. They meet throughout the week, throughout the river region. And so if you're interested and you haven't gotten plugged into one yet, if you'll see me this morning, I'll be glad to kind of point you in a direction. Now, the community groups in the weeks ahead will actually be doing a study uh, that, that goes right along with what Matt's speaking with, with a series on Grave Robber. I'm excited about this. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the, the book that the leaders of the group will be using, I ordered mine on Amazon this morning, Grave Robber by Mark Batterson. If you are an Amazon Prime member, anybody besides me use Amazon Prime? Okay, got it shipped overnight for like 12 bucks. And so that's a hardback book, overnight shipping. You, you can't beat that if you're interested. But regardless, make sure you join us on Easter Sunday, next Sunday morning as we get this series started. And make sure to bring somebody with you. The Waffle Bar is going to be set up. By the way...